inferring that. We've had a problem, now we're good to go. Really. So, we can't do any talk about Apollo without seeing this guy. And he did this speech, um, 12th of September 1962 at the Rice University. But it was in um, on May the 25th, 1961, where Kennedy um, did a speech to uh, the joint session of Congress asking for more money and to commit to go to the moon. And if you've probably seen it and listened to it, and it was pretty much this Rice speech, but it was really a matter of fact. You know, just give it, literally giving the facts and explaining the situation and what they had to do. But it was Rice what literally galvanised the nation to get their act together and bring the nation together um, and appeal to the American, you know, pioneering spirit, sense of adventure to go on this um, mission. But, what, but when he made this speech, it was only literally seven months after John Glenn aboard Friendship 7 had become the first American to orbit planet Earth. And then here he was saying, we're going to go to the moon. What? in what, seven years, even though there'd been no space walks, you know, it had yet happened, no docking in space, had not been practiced, and, you know, there's no lunar lander, obviously, you know, I was going to get to the moon, literally. So, for the average American, the race to the moon had been won, interest had waned, they'd been there the previous year, 69, with Apollo 11, the first historic landing, uh, Apollo 12, that was a precision landing, but again, in the same area, pretty safe, that sort of thing. So interest was raining, waning. So in the uh, mission control, there was no media at all for this launch of Apollo 13. But this was going to be a purely scientific mission, find out about the moon. And this was the region that was going to go to, the Frau Moro region. Um, coming up to pretty much that time of the lunar cycle where you could view that area on it. And it was going to this area because it's believed the ejector blanket from the Imbium impact basin that covered that area. So a particular interest was Cone Crater what was literally like a, or basically a big hole in a hilly part of that area. We was gonna survey, go down, get some samples of the, you know, rugged highland area of the moon. So, this was the ASLEP package, what was gonna be taken on Apollo 13. It consisted of a passive seismic experiment pack package, you know, listen to moon quakes. It was so sensitive it could pick up the astronauts' footsteps. Um, a lunar surface magnetometer to ensure, to measure the, the variations in the lunar magnetic field. A solar wind spectrometer to measure the energy and density of the direction and variation of the particles emitted from the sun, that sort of stuff. Um, a super thermo super thermal ion detector to measure different types of numbers of the ions, what was interacting with the moon's surface. All this was going to be uh, powered by um, an RTG, a, a radio isotope thermoelectric generator. Think uh, Voyagers 1 and 2, where the heat from a radioactive um, isotope like plutonium decays and then it generates heat and that's converted to electricity to power these instruments. Um, they weren't expected to last more than a year, but quite often they, they did. Some packed up, you know, within a few months, but generally they gave good service. Um, so on Apollo 13, it was a full suite of instruments, what was going to fly. Um, on Apollo 11, there's only um, a couple of experiments that went. It's called the Apollo, uh, Early Apollo Surface Experiment Package. And it, like I say, it only consisted of two experiments, which this wasn't widely reported because, you know, to be honest, who would want to admit flying to the moon and you only had a small package? So let's meet the crew. This is the captain, uh, Jim Lovell. 
born in 1928. He was selected as an astronaut in 1962. Lovell was making his fourth space flight and second trip to the moon. First person ever to achieve the, this milestone. He piloted Gemini 7, command pilot of Gemini 12, and of course, Apollo 8. Who could forget that? First mission, first piloted mission to the moon. Yeah. We've got uh, Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot. Hayes was also, he was making his first space flight. And, of course, we've got Jack Swigert, the command module pilot. He was also making his first space flight. Swigert was backup command module pilot. It was actually this guy who we're, we're all pretty sure about, uh, Ken Mattingly. He was a prime command module pilot. But as you know, I mean, Apollo 13 has literally been really covered, so it was billed as a failure. He'd been exposed to German measles rebella, by um, one of the backup crew members, Charlie Duke, eight days prior to launch. And it was through his physical examinations it was realised he'd got no immunity to the disease. So um, on April the 10th, the day before the launch, <laughs> Swiger was named in place of Mattingly. I think if you get the chance, you want to um, listen to some of the uh, interviews Ken Mattingly did, and it's quite a funny and interesting guy, actually, about how he heard about it. He heard about it was being replaced, literally driving down the road, you know, in his car. And he, he thought, you know, if this was a joke, we're having a damn good joke. So Mattingly was replaced. It was all very quick. I mean, this was one of the photographs of the what, what would have been the prime crew to fly. And this is the crew what eventually did fly and say so this is them by the on the 10th of april the crew hayes swigert and lovell how it had been changed around just in that short space of time <clears throat> so the patch Again, the pilot, you know, the, the crew designed their own patches, and this has um, represented Apollo, the sun god of Greek mythology, was represented as the sun, with three horses driving across the surface of the moon, symbolising how the Apollo flights have extended the light of knowledge you know, to all mankind. I go, the Latin phrase, ex luna scientia, it means from the moon, knowledge. So there was a, a few firsts actually on Apollo 13, because like I said, they'd been there a couple of times, you know, sort of a couple of practice runs to see how things were going. So can we do this? And it was, it was getting pretty confident that this would happen. So um, like I said, there was no media in the launch control for when it actually Apollo 13 flew. So again, NASA was a bit concerned about this. So they've taken as many steps as possible to uh, try and draw up some interest. So one of the first, they actually had a makeup bag because it was concerned about astronauts coming back, you know, a bit dishevelled and they wanted to look the best for the um, media when they come back. Come on. Oh, no. Oh, no. What are you doing? <laughs> It's froze. No. Oh, God. No. Uh, shall I close yeah. it down and try it again? Yeah, it's you can. Bloody hell. So try just pressing escape to bring it out of presentation mode. Nothing. Oh, I no. oh, okay. So it's actually locked up the whole of PowerPoint. Okay. You might have to relaunch it then. Oh, I go. Oh. Bloody hell. Totally me and technology. A quick interlude. Coffees if anybody wants any. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Seamlessly carrying on. Anyway, where were we? Okay, makeup bags. Yes, of course. Here we go. There we go. The blusher brush. Um, the astronauts have got to look the best. Obviously, there is a rumor that this brush was also used to clean the camera lenses. Personally, I don't believe that. Oops. Anyway. All right. What's for lunch? Certainly no crumbs. 
uh, was on this flight where there's a, a real good selection of uh, sandwiches, that sort of stuff, and spreads, because NASA, even today, and other flight, you know, space agencies really do not like crumbs. But for this, there's actually upgraded the um, food that the astronauts have taken on board. Of course, they've got um, dried meals with access to hot water to, you know, rehydrate them and stuff like that. But they've actually taken a selection of sandwiches on this one as well. So things were looking up. These are some of the first sandwiches on board, apart from the uh, corned beef sandwich John Young smuggled on board Gemini 3 in 65. I bet that was nice. <laughs> and who goes there? Um, it was a chap called Brian Duff who had just been handed the job of public affairs, just literally as Apollo 11 was coming you know, was on the way back from the first moon landing you know, for publicity and stuff like that. So he was there feverishly looking through all the images, trying to find a picture of Armstrong, first man on the moon. It soon became a race to try and get any picture of Armstrong so they could release it to the world's press. So it was this chap, Brian Duff, who suggested of these red stripes on the astronaut, you know, on the commander's uh, spacesuits so that you could easily identify him. Originally, there was called public affairs strikes, but later that was changed. And that was never going to wash, was it? <laughs> public affairs, yes, there we go. So it was a change later to commander stripes. It was too late for Apollo 12, but 13 was going to be the first flight uh, where these straps were going to be on board. And really, when you're looking through all the rooms of photographs to see the um, Lovell with this red stripe on, very few actually before they actually flew. So there was a few firsts on, and it's also got the furthest flown um, when they actually loop around the, the moon. Um, I think that record yeah, does still stand because there was actually 158 miles above the surface. So there's pretty much turned up, you know, 248,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. And that's a record what still stands today. So quite often billed as a failure, but there's actually quite a few firsts what happened on that. Um, ah, OK. Missed you. <laughs> I put this in because check out the guy here on the left, and my cursor comes up, and he's just hanging about it. So this is an everyday occurrence. How do you know? It's just obviously the, the lunar lander just being stacked, uh, ready for putting on board the rest of the Saturn V. But again, it just smacks of blase. Been there, seen it, done it. God, I'd be mesmerised if I was there. I know we um, lucky enough to see Cassini fly. And before that, there was a, a weather uh, satellite what went up as well. And no one was really interested. I was glued watching it. They were just, the Americans have got this thing of seeing so many space flights go, they're just like an everyday occurrence. But I see, I thought it was really amusing, really. The guy to stand there, you know, yeah, okay, get on with it. So anyway. Oh, oh, thank you. So the launch, April the 11th, 1970. It should be noted that Saturn V first flew unmanned on uh, <clears throat> November the 19th, 1967, with all uh, three stages performing flawlessly. Uh, and after that, there was only one other shakedown flight, you know, unmanned. And then the third flight took well, Borman, Lovell and Anders to orbit the moon. <laughs> How long are this? Well, they're still building the space launch system at the moment, aren't they? Okay. That was brilliant. Third launch, away you go, fellas. Anyway, first stage, the F1 engines ignited and seven and a half million pounds of thrust burnt for about two and a half minutes. And took it to about 38 miles. Up and then uh, obviously explosive bolts dropped the first stage away and it landed in the Atlantic. But now actually you probably know anyway they've, they've recovered some of the um, first stage. Uh, is it Jeff Bezos has got it up? Some of the engines and bits and pieces and things like that. And NASA's um, displaying them. So really interesting. Anyway, 
the uh, there's normally one glitch on these apollo launchers and the center engine cut out early so the rest of the engines the four remaining engines had to burn 34 seconds longer to get it up into this correct um orbit well not orbit up into the atmosphere for it you know jettisoned then the second stage had five j2 engines and that burned for another six minutes taking the payload up to about 115 miles and about a thousand miles down range and by that time it was doing just over 15,000 miles an hour so that had done its job and just left, left the third stage which was at a single j2 engine and that took you up into orbit and did a orbit and a half just checking the old shebang out to make sure it was good to go and that took about two and a half hours and then they did the trans lunar injection burn oh, crikey when are we going to get back to that point where they can stop messing about in low earth orbit and go exploring so i think it's that what's literally going to galvanize the rest of the world go out and explore We've done enough low earth orbit they've had enough little trips up and down let's get out there and view so it was um translunar injection burn that took well 350 seconds this increased the spacecraft velocity to, to escape earth orbit you know 24 and a half thousand miles an hour to escape earth's gravity and put it on um, a course for the moon and approximately 30 minutes later, the command module, Orisa, emerged out, turned around. Is that the one? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got it. Came out, turned around, and dragged Aquarius out. So this is the configuration that there was flying in then to the moon. And normally, this third stage has just put you know commanded to go into a, a solar orbit out the way done with it get on with it i think it weighs about twenty nine thousand pounds that part of the saturn five so but this time ground control commanded it to actually fly an impact of the moon because apollo 12 had put a, a size monitor on as part of the aslet package on the surface of the moon when that landed and sure enough the third stage did impact the moon and um, the seismometer was picking up all these vibrations for a good i think it was more than three hours later um and this gave the uh, scientists a little a view sort of thing of the interior of the moon because like i say this was a pure science mission now getting onto the really interesting bits so that's how they was flying connected up the command module and the lunar lander was on its way so it was when it was in this configuration again some more of the science was taken where it's taking photographs of earth as part of the um, science support package looking into the earth weather systems and things like that so again that was another part of the mission what was completed and it was shortly after this where a second mid-course correction burn was initiated. This lowered the uh, approach of the spacecraft to just 60 miles above the lunar surface. Before this, if they hadn't done any other burns or anything like that, it would have been on what we call a free return from Earth uh, to Earth. It would have looped around the moon and come back towards Earth without any real major uh, course correction. So don't you just know it to get to this point and you mess about with stuff and then you're in a problem anyway so it was during the first 40 hours of the flight you know the crew was there checking stuff out as they do make sure things were working getting things ready that sort of stuff and all the data was coming back to um, ground control or everything was performing really good Well, oh yeah, no, 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 can't do yet. So everything so far really boring. However, at 55 hours ground elapsed time, a master alarm alerted the crew to a low pressure reading in cryogenic tank oxygen two to reach to the low end of its operating levels. 
So, uh, and this had happened several times so far in the flight. So flight controllers requested the crew turn on the cryogenic systems and fans and heaters. And that's his point. So I did, no, don't, don't do that. Too late. So, oops, oh yeah, thank you. Yes, we're up, we're up, we're up. So, these, whoops, are the fuel cells on board the service module. And that's a schematic on the right of how the setup was. So, pretty sure you're all very familiar with the Apollo 13. So, this is the fuel cells invented by a guy from this country. It wasn't all American um, engineers and scientists what was doing this. I do believe, didn't they ask Patrick Moore to supply moon maps, I think, if I remember correctly, you know, to help NASA in the early years and stuff like that to find out what the moon was made of, how it was made and formations and stuff like that. Because literally they weren't even sure if anything could land on it, if it did sink and stuff, how stable the surface was. So they were pulling in all sorts of help from around the world. So these are the fuel cells. You can just see the tops of the liquid oxygen tanks there. That's those there. So this, the liquid oxygen cells, which were the primary power source of the command module and the water that resulted from the chemical reaction. This water it wasn't only used for the crew for drinking and preparing Food, but it also cooled the 1960s electrics down. So obviously it's really important. So this importance meant that there was a lot of redundancy in built into the system. So you can't just run on one of it. So a lot of redundancy was built into the system. So there were three fuel cells, two oxygen tanks and two hydrogen tanks. And these were all mounted in section four of the service module. It was a um, big cylindrical object and it was all divided into sections. Um, but the, these oxygen tanks, just, they weren't just literally simple containers. Um, they were self-contained units. They had insulation, sensors, propellant management hardware. So there's a really high tech piece of kit and they carried uh, 148 kilograms of liquid oxygen in two concentric spheres with a layer of fiberglass. Oops, is that the one? Yeah, that's them. With a layer of fiberglass between them. Um, and these tanks were strong because they had to operate at very high pressure. And it was the high pressure that would keep the liquid oxygen in what's called a supercritical state. Um, and this solved a lot of problems in managing fluids in zero gravity. Um, a supercritical state is where uh, there's no transition from a liquid to a gas. There's no layering bubbles or droplets that form. Like in uh, normal liquid oxygen, you get bubbles in zero gravity. So it's not a uniform mix. So, Supercritical fluids are good because you get consistency in pressure or you know with pressure and flow rates. So it technically makes it easier to manage to measure how much of the you know how much uh, fluid is in the tank. But the downside is supercritical fluids need high pressure. In oxygen, it's a it's about 50 atmospheric pressure you know, to keep it in this state. Uh so the the heaters oh, come on come on that's this element here on the right oh get back no back bugger uh, the heaters run alongside a sensor which is that come on which is that that's a heater on the right and that's a uh, the gauge, what literally told you, you know, how much is in the, you know, the tank. 
Uh, well, no, I don't think. Um, there were concerns that um, in zero gravity there would be no convection in these oxygen tanks. So when it was warm, the mixture would slowly mix around the tank. This would mean that the fill sensor would only show low values, so not given a true reading, so you won't really know how much is actually in the tank. So to ensure the warmed oxygen would be a good mix, oh, where is it? they had fans, that's it, fans in the top and in the bottom. So these fans could be turned on to stir the liquid oxygen to allow reliable reading of the fill sensor. So all the wiring, all this stuff here is right up in the top. I was trying to look some images what might give you a better, uh, a clearer view, but it's just not very clear. So we'll go with this. Um, so all the wiring was inside these tanks. So to, to, and it was sheathed in um, a coating called, you know, in Teflon. That was used as an insulator because Teflon is pretty inert and doesn't burn in air normally. Oops, can that be that the one? Yeah, yeah, okay. So well, Teflon is just a marketing name. It's uh, the real name, well, the technical name is polytetrafluoroethylene. And no, I'm not going to say it again. And, oops, go back, sorry. And finally, in the top of the tank in here, that's where all the plumbing was, uh, uh, where they used to fill the tank, drain the tank, vent the tank, that sort of thing. Oops, yeah, okay. That's one of the hydrogen tanks, and that's the well, they can just about see the oxygen tank itself there. Okay, so this has got a bit of an interesting life behind it. It was um, tank two was originally slated for service module 106, which that would eventually fly as Apollo 10, but around the time. Changes were being implemented, uh, implemented to the design. So a decision was made to remove that tank and replace it with an updated version. So, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, the tanks were paired together in a triangular shelf arrangement. It weren't just a tank, that was it. It was like a complete shelf with all the connections and all manner of other gubbins all on it. So it wasn't just a tank, it was a complete shelf that would be fitted in the service module. So it was the entire shelf, what would be removed. So the removal didn't, oops, oh God. So that was all done. The changes were implemented, implemented in the design. So the decision were made to remove it and replace it with an updated version. So the tanks were paired up in a triangular shelf that would be fitted in the service module. So it's like I said, the entire shelf. Yeah, is that one? No, back. Oops. Okay. It's okay. We'll get used to this in a minute. <laughs> anyway, um, the removal didn't go according to plan. And it was while they were trying to remove the shelf, a bolt at the back that was holding the shelf was, was, wasn't released. Um, and it was like a jig arrangement that was connected up to this shelf that held it in place to remove everything carefully. And it was like, say, while I was trying to remove the shelf, a bolt was missed. So it was still connected to the service module. And it was during this procedure, too much stress was put on the uh, supporting rig, what was removing the shelf, and the rig actually broke, letting the top of the shelf actually drop. But before it dropped, let's go back. Let's go back a moment. The top of the shelf, this bit on the tank, actually hit the shelf above it before it dropped back down. So it's believed it 
can't be proven, but the spill, the fill tank, the fill tube in that part was damaged and was locked, dislodged loose. So, uh, so in the old shelf was removed, including the tank too. That hit the top of the shelf, a ball dropped, and that's where the damage occurred. Well, it couldn't be proved. The, the Apollo 13 accident investigation panel believed it was that impact. It's damaged a fill tube in the top of the tank. Um, and we, this wasn't in itself dangerous, but that's what they believed happened. So the shelf was removed, upgrades were made, tests were performed, and the shelf was then installed in service module 109. And no prizes for guessing where service module 109 was going to be mated up to and flew. Yes. So it was all inspected, tested and flown to Kennedy Space Center and fitted to the Apollo 13 service module. So and it was during March when the whole of the Saturn V was stacked on the launch pad. About two weeks before flight, there was doing flight testing procedures took place. And one of these procedures was to fill the liquid oxygen tanks to 100%. And later, the test required that there was emptied to 50%. This was done by blowing a gaseous pressurised oxygen into the tank, opening the fill line and allowing the gaseous oxygen to be pushed out, to push the liquid oxygen out of the tank. Tank 1 drained correctly, but tank 2 only drained to 92%. They repeated it a few times, but no more liquid had come out. Um, this was probably because of the loose connector in the top of the tank, and it was probably the gas what was coming out of the tank, you know, instead of the, the liquid oxygen. So the ground crew decided to use another way to empty the tank. They would use the heaters to boil off the liquid and vent it as a gas. The heaters on the ground were more powerful. They had 65 volts as opposed to the spacecraft's 28 mm. The requirements to handle this voltage, this extra, this higher voltage, had been part of the original specifications. And Beach engineers confirmed that all the hardware had been approved for 65 volts, or so they thought. So the heaters, but the heaters had thermostats, and they would cut the power to the heaters if the temperature went above 80 degrees Fahrenheit or about 27 degrees Celsius. The original Switch, a bit long-winded this, but bear with me. <laughs> the original switch was specified for 28 volts and had been okay for 65, but, but somehow the switching action had never been verified for 65 volts. And it turns out the higher voltage actually welded the contacts together. So that was just never going to work. And that the safety part of it was null and void so it turns out that the voltage actually welded the switch contacts together during the ground test to empty tank two uh, because the heaters have been left on to run for eight hours and the temperature probably reached about 500 degrees celsius they're certainly going to get welded together but this crucially was above the point where teflon yes our friend teflon can break down the insulation, insulation was probably damaged during this test, but there was no outward um, evidence, you know, to show this because it was all internal. So none of the wiring, you know, could be accessed. So this, you know, was just a ticking time bomb, basically. Um, so there's no outward evidence to show this. The problem about emptying the tank was discussed by engineers and it was estimated to take about two days to replace the entire shelf with the oxygen tanks. And then more time to um, do these fill empty tests as well. And then there's also concerns about if they did any more damage or anything like that to other components, removing the whole shelf and all the other paraphernalia to replace that tank. So the problem to empty the tank on the ground wouldn't be an have an impact on the flight performance in zero gravity. So, as they do, the decision was made to fly. I think that with the challenge of 
uh, accident, I think these people who make these decisions ought to put themselves, would they be okay to fly knowing what they knew, you know, about the unorthodox procedure to try and empty tank too? Would they be okay? Would they put the, their lives on the line? So I think just use that as a bit of a safety buffer. But no, it was okay to fly. So it flew. So uh, 55 hours into the mission, a request was made to stir oxygen tank two to access an unrelated issue. Um, so this time a short occurred, allowing the damaged Teflon to ignite. Now, remember, Teflon doesn't, you know, it's quite inert. It doesn't really burn in oxygen. Um, it, but if you've probably seen Apollo 13 film where they you know, throw the switch and then the next second, you know, it's like it, it, it switching the igniter on, on a bomb. But it was actually more than a minute um, since, from throwing the switch to when they realised they'd got a problem. So like I say, Teflon, it was damaged because it literally baked on the ground test. So um, it was probably that called, you know, ignited. But say it doesn't normally burn in air, but Teflon would burn to when they did ground tests, after, you know, when they back on Earth in 50 atmospheric pressures of oxygen. It can sustain combustion. So this Teflon uh, sheathing was like a slow burning fuse. So hence, uh, like a minute before throwing the switch, and then obviously they know they've got a problem. So this burning is believed to raise the pressure in the oxygen tank. And um, there was a relief valve, which probably operated, but couldn't reduce the pressure quickly enough. And Teflon wasn't the only material in the tank. Uh, there was aluminium was present. And if this burnt, this, this uh, aluminium would certainly burn more energetically if that ignited. But there's no real evidence to say that um, ignited. So anyway, the tank blew. The tank blew uh, a rupture valve at five atmospheric pressures, letting all the um, oh, no. <laughs> so the tank blew um, a rupture valve at five atmospheric pressures, letting all the pressurized oxygen out into section four of the service module, which is all this. And when they did ground tests after the astronauts came back, um, it was believed there was enough um, heat and um, pressure to ignite all this insulation around these tanks, which eventually caused the whole side of the service module to blow out on section four. So, like I say, during test, it was found that this would ignite. And obviously, when the panel blew out, it uh, took the communications mast as well with it, hence the initial dropout of all communications. So, that, let's go there. So, obviously, that's where the moon landing mission ended. And of course, the astronauts died a few hours later. That's what would have happened if NASA had gone on its original intended course. Now, what we have to do is go back to 1961. Get off. After Kennedy committed to go to the moon, NASA had to decide, well, how the hell are we going to get to the moon in such a small space of time, you know, seven years. So NASA gave serious consideration to three options. I think we should go with option one, because option one was the direct ascent. That's where they built a, a massive booster the size of a battleship. You know, the typical one like uh, Tintin goes to the moon. I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen that where one big spaceship flies from the Earth <laughs> directly to the moon, lands on the moon, and then comes back to planet Earth, all one big spaceship. I say, go with that. This, this would be like chartering a bus moving from point A to point B, and then back 
to point A again in one giant vehicle. This, <clears throat> this concept had strong support in NASA. But after engineers looked at, you know, did all the calculations, they realized the amount of fuel that this rocket would need to break <clears throat> against the moon's gravity and then go back to Earth and break against the Earth's gravity, it was a bit unrealistic. So unfortunately, that never saw the light of day. I think we need to revisit that, though. Option two, Earth Orbit Rendezvous. rendezvous. <clears throat> The main idea was this, was to launch two smaller boosters independently into Earth orbit using the advanced Saturn rocket that was being developed at the time. And have two boosters rendezvous in Earth orbit, assemble, fuel and detach one a lunar lander, one spacecraft to fly then from Earth <clears throat> to the moon, land on the moon, come back to Earth, and then board a capsule, you know, land safely back on Earth. Uh, this um, uh, had the advantage that it required a less powerful rocket. When well, NASA had one coming, to, you know, to close to the end of its development, you know, the Saturn rocket, and also um, they'd end up after they'd been to the moon and done all the landing stuff. They'd end up eventually with a space station, so they'd get the moon bit done and end up with a. Um, space station so two for the price of one so to speak and this enjoyed very strong support in NASA oh Werner von Braun favoured this approach now option three was a lunar orbit rendezvous this was a chosen option of a small group in uh, the Langley Research Center. And they'd been experimenting with this idea since 1959. And the basic idea was to fire an assembled spacecraft up into orbit atop of one powerful rocket. And this consisted of uh, the command module, <clears throat> service module, and a small lunar lander. Once in orbit, the last stage of the rocket boosted the lunar lander and command mothership to the moon and then they'd detach and the small lander, lunar lander, would drop onto the moon, come back up, connect up to the mothership, fly back and then that would detach and they have a capsule to land safely back on Earth. It was in late six, 1961 and 62, NASA arranged uh, an internal task force to look at all these options. And is this, this option, option three, was literally booted out of the window very, very quickly. It just did not have much support. But here's the guy, John Hol Holbolt, I think that's how he pronounced his name, just shown, given a demonstration of how it would work. And when he realised he wasn't going to get the way, you know, his really elegant way of getting to the moon in this small space of time, and fulfilling Kennedy's dream. He, he contacted NASA directly to put this option to them. As previously, it's been, you know, come a distant third, and all the other options are, you know, getting far more um, looking. So, but eventually, the main players came round to this way of thinking, and it gained favour from all the main players. But even at that point, the guy, this guy called Jerome Wisner, who was President Kennedy's chief scientific advisor, still favoured the direct approach. <laughs> Go for it. So eventually, this is it. And this is just John Holbolt just explaining the command module, service module, the lunar lander, where it would um, fly off around the moon, come back and land on. A really neat, elegant design what worked but i say initially <clears throat> nasa said way too complicated now if anything went wrong you know they'd be way over at the moon and the crew would die i mean I say space is a dangerous thing if you're going to put humans up there you've got to accept that risk so anyway thankfully they did survive because of this guy really pushing for this because it could have been a whole different experience 
<clears throat> Come on, admit it. You want one of these, don't you? <laughs> so this is the configuration it was flying in when they had this problem when they stirred the crack tanks um, on that. <clears throat> so luckily, if you're all familiar with this, where has it gone? Come here. You're all familiar with the setup. We've got the lunar lander, got the command module. This is where the crew is. Got to remember the crew couldn't see anything what was going off back here where all the, the workings, all the instrumentation, the fuel was kept to service the command module so this is the configuration it was flying in and it was pretty soon after about 90 minutes uh there's going to have to use the lunar lander as a as a lifeboat now this scenario had been looked at you know a few years earlier <clears throat> so it wasn't a total new idea new concept they had looked at it I think overall, <clears throat> you can see this is a project Apollo was a massive undertaking. I really, yeah, sure, there's some things what they got wrong and some procedures what they did were a bit questionable. But overall, fantastic achievement from just a few years to put all this new technology, new materials together to get them to the moon. And a big explosion, big problem. And it still wasn't dead. The astronauts still didn't die. It still got there. So this is the configuration they're flying in. So at this point, it was a characterized by two objectives, planning and conducting the required maneuvers to return the spacecraft back to Earth. Because don't forget, it's on a trajectory for not free return. If it was left as it is, it would have looped round the moon and missed planet Earth by a considerable margin. So that frantically working, and it was only about 15 minutes of power left in the lunar in the command module when it had to be when it was finally powered down and the important guidance from the command module was transferred to the lunar lander because the lunar lander only had a rudimentary guidance, not as sophisticated as the command module. So they really had to crack on. Luckily, they got all the um, calculations transferred in record breaking time to the lunar lander. So after that, it was managing consumables. You know, the lunar lander was only designed for two astronauts for a very short period, and how it would perform as a command module was now to had three people. So that was characterized of it. So very shortly after, after 61 hours, ground elapsed time, a maneuver was conducted where the five, the um, lunar lander engine luckily that engine could be fired up and restarted the um, top part of the lander as you're well aware was it just um once only fire it and that was it you couldn't really control it it was a burn once go away engine so but luckily it was a restartable engine so it was fired to pull it on a free return back to earth and that was a 34 second burn and that put it on a free return to earth and this is the um in, you know the view the astronauts had as they were approaching the earth so near yet so far and <laughs> lovell there's, there's loads of information about this mission and lovell were very pleased that hayes and swigert were occupying themselves looking out of the windows taking photographs you know like two kids in a sweet shop They'd, and they pointed out to Lovell that, you know, he'd been there, seen it and done it before on Apollo 8. <laughs> so they swung around the moon and was out of contact for just over 24 minutes. So uh, 79 hours ground elapsed time, a, a trans-Earth injection manoeuvre was performed. In other words, they're going to light the engine again. And this was for 263 seconds. And this actually speeded up the return because... Um, round 
pegs in at square pegs in round holes time. You've seen, you've seen all this on the film and read about it and all manner of things. Unbelievably, the different filters for the command module and the lunar lander. So they obviously didn't think this would be an issue. So this is um, Dick, Dick Slayton in the check jacket, just showing how you know the people in mission control the adapter, what they'd made, you know, to make a, a round peg fit the square hole. And there was obviously using only stuff that got in the lunar lander and the command module to make this. So it was a matter of conserving the lunar module batteries because they needed that for the, uh, the command module batteries because they needed that for re entry. The lunar lander batteries were needed. Um, for the rest of the mission and the lunar lander oxygen for breathing so it was showing up carbon dioxide so they had to mack all this filter up with the bits and bobs that got on board and that's they relayed all this up to the astronauts and that's what they did made it out of gaffer tape and, and mat socks and other material they had on board the spacecraft and that's the big white the, the big white unit here is the environmental control unit of the lunar lander and they're the uh, round pegs and they're the filters that go down here so you can see the size of the one in the command module so they're the filters that's the environmental thing but time to go all this rigged up hey, everything was unky dory and very soon the, the dangerous gases were dropping down to an acceptable level. So this is the astronauts, Jerry rigging other bits and pieces. Like I say, what they did was uh, trickle charge the command module batteries from the batteries on the lunar lander. They powered it as much of, of everything down as what they possibly could um, on that. So during the film, you saw, I think it was, was it, I forget the name of the guy in the film who did it, but there's a, struggling with the power being used to fire up the computers in the command module and stuff like that. But when you look through all the transcripts and stuff like that, that wasn't an issue at all. I couldn't find anything where they were saying the batteries, you know, we're not sure the batteries are going to light up all the instruments we need to make the command module work again um, on it. But that was not an issue. So whether they played that up on the film, because the film was pretty accurate the typical hollywood and took a few liberties but i couldn't find anything what said the batteries are critical on that so the jerry rigged various other bits and pieces up all getting ready for splashdown but well, that splashdown like i say even though the ration water and battery power there's still many hours of water left um and there's still a good amount of battery power remaining so um, they had heaters on board, but not really enough power to use them. Again, they just didn't have them on. So just how cold was it? Well, in May 1970, all three astronauts gave an interview to Life magazine in Hawaii. Lovell and Hayes stated um, in that interview that they put the lunar boots on and Swigert, he didn't have any because he was never intended to land on the moon. So he put on an extra pair of long johns and they huddled together to try and keep warm. But it wasn't too bad when there's moving around, you know, something to do, takes your mind off being cold. But at no point did they consider putting on their spacesuits to keep warm uh, <clears throat> as they thought that if another emergency happened, the bulky spacesuits would hinder the, the ability to move about quickly and, you know, get things done in, you know, at a pace. And in the same interview, Swigert stated that the temperature in Aquarius was 10 degrees Celsius and Odyssey was 3.8 degrees Celsius. Cold, but not unbearably cold. Certainly, um, well, I think it was Tom Hanks was banging a frozen sausage on the side of the spacecraft. It certainly wasn't frozen sausage um, cold. So the uh, unprecedented power down required 
um, several new command procedures, you know, to get ready for re-entry, that sort of stuff. And there's lots of reports that the, all the panels were covered in moisture and stuff like that, but there's no frost and stuff like that. Like I said, it was cold, but not that cold. So um, it was thought that all the damp was also behind the instruments as well. But thanks to the improvements made after the Apollo 1 fire in 1967, no arcing took place. But when the service module was jettisoned, they gave the astronauts obviously a lot. Gave the astronauts a first view of the damage, we can see it, damage section of it. And then people started realizing, was the heat shield damaged? So the great unknown. So nothing could be done. So we just had to go for it. Um, the passive roll had been stopped, obviously, because the spacecraft was rolling, so it didn't overheat in one place. And then the service module was ejected. Um, and then about 70 minutes before, this is um, Lovell just doing a power down of the lunar lander. And then about 70 minutes before re-entry, Aquarius was jettisoned the lifeboat. And then there was committed. The capsule re-entered Earth's atmosphere at about 400,000 feet at 36,000 feet a second. Boy, that's quick. And of course, um, with sh the shuttle program, we're used to um, being in co contact. Ground control was still in contact with the shuttle when it was landing, uh, after the first few landings anyway, because they had um, satellites called the uh, tracking and data relay satellites. So because the shape of the shuttle uh, left a, a hole in a plasma stream behind it, so radio signals could be um, enter the shuttle and lead the shuttle through this hole in the plasma stream behind it. So that's how they could keep in contact on the shuttle, but the capsule, the whole lot was enveloped in it, so with this blackout during re-entry. So that was a real it was more squeaky bum time, wasn't it, basically? Well, I must say, though, um, the lunar lander it was left and it tumbled back in an intended you know, Earth's atmosphere, burnt up. But parts of it did actually um, re, you know, survive the entry. Um, the RTG um, radioactive capsule, that was designed anyway to survive re-entry because that was in case something happened to the during launch. You know, it wasn't going to explode and all this radioactive material scattered everywhere. So that was, it, you know survivable coming through but other pieces did hit um the open sea between well, around new zealand but it did survive it was in blackout for about 90 seconds longer but yes it did survive the um re -entry. And obviously, you know, they all lived happily ever after. The capsule, actually, NASA saw this as, well, they got the astronauts back, great. But they saw it as a failure. So after recovery, the capsule was um, like mothballed in a, a warehouse in Florida for about six months. And um, <laughs> a museum in Paris, Le, in uh, Le Bourguet, I think that's how it's pronounced asked the Smithsonian and NASA if there had any space artifacts they could have. And like I said, NASA viewed the mission as it was a failure. So they allowed them to have the capsule. And there it stayed for 20 years. Lovell and his wife actually went to view it. And they saw that seats were missing, uh, the hatch were missing, and some instrument panels. But I think I, I saw a report that NASA took these bits out to use in part of the investigation. Um, and it was, we'll say, 20 years Later, when more interest was being taken in Apollo 13, that, you know, a museum in Kansas says, well, you know, where is it? And NASA says, well, it's in Paris. So this museum, the um, Kansas Cosmos, Cosmosphere, 
and Space Center in Hutchinson, went over there and brought it back. And that's where you'll find the capsule of Apollo 13. So um, we know all about why the accident happened, but you look at it, it vindicates a lot of things NASA did, like the concept of a backup crew were vindicated, you know, Swigert for Mattingly, for example, just a day or three before the launch, went seamlessly. And in interviews afterwards, Lovell and Hayes said they were happy to fly with him and there was no issues or anything like that. The performance of the lunar lander to sustain the crew for a longer period than it was intended to. So again, that worked. The uh, effectiveness of the pre-mission crew training, especially with ground person personnel, again, that reflected the skill and precision in which the crew responded and stuff like that. So obviously we know the Apollo program still continued and there was a few changes to the command module. It had an extra oxygen tank, which was away from section four. They had isolation valves so they could switch them off and isolate it and still save the others. If there's any other further problems, there was stainless steel sheathing for vulnerable areas, you know, tubes and pipes and such like that. Extra water was carried. It was made easier to charge batteries from the lunar lander to the command module module in flight and there was an up, an extra uprated battery was also carried but the um the shape of the filters they stayed the same in the command module and the lunar lander but they carried extra ones and the liquid oxygen tanks were redesigned so hopefully well that there was no other issues afterwards so but it does raise the question during the tanks during the missions normally are stirred every 24 hours. So if they'd kept to that routine, when they asked the crew to perform that particular stir of the tanks every 24 hours, that would have occurred while Lovell and Hayes were actually on the moon during the rest period after the first lunar walk. So they would have been woken up to say there'd been a problem with the command module. And it might have happened, that, well, well Swag would have been on his own, could have been, it could have happened just when it, gone round, it had gone round the uh, backside of the moon out of radio communications and, you know, would he have panicked on his own or something like that, even though he was a test pilot and stuff like that. So it's lucky um, it happened, you know, they did these extra stirs and they, they was doing this because it was getting, um, well, fluctuations in the reading and there was like trying to troubleshoot what the problem would be. So there's like trying to test something if you see if it broke. So it certainly did. So it's all, if it had happened then, there would have certainly been a different outcome. Because they were certainly wanting to have power and stuff like that, you know, they only had the uh, top part of the lunar lander to come back. So it's very doubtful whether they would have got back because they didn't know the condition of the service module engine. You know, if it would have would, would have been able to fire it up, you know, it would have been any other damage. And it, to fire that main engine up required a lot of electricity. So whew, could have been a lot of could have been a different story if. They had to have done these extra stirs to the tank. So that's my take on Apollo 13. That's how I've seen it. Try to put a little different spin on it. And hopefully there's been little bits in it what perhaps you've not heard about or perhaps forgotten about. And just nice to get a little bit of a refresher. But I don't see it as a failure. It's just a great, you know, human spirit of uh, will and daring and skill and stuff like that. So it's a, for me, it's a success. And we need to go back to the moon and beyond. Thank you very much. I'm out of here now. <laughs> well done, Rob. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I would die, I think. Is that?